Who was the biggest flop in world football this season? Mark Kukurea was fairly abject. For a man who costs more than £60 million, Raheem Sterling had his worst season since his teens, and Kalidou Koulibaly looked like a bit of a donkey for someone who cost £33 million, was paid almost £300,000 a week, and called John Terry before this season began to ask for permission to wear his number 26 shirt. There were even some flops who weren't signed by Chelsea. Calvin Phillips didn't start a single league game for Manchester City until they had already won the Premier League title. Gianluca Scamacca could only manage a measly three Premier League goals in his first season at West Ham. And even Cristiano Ronaldo, practically infallible for most of the last 20 years, had a pretty rotten campaign, scoring just one goal in 10 Premier League games, being frozen out at Manchester United, suffering an early World Cup exit, and sailing off for the desert sand of Saudi Arabia. The 2022-23 season is no exception having lots of players who fell far short of expectations. And in today's video, I wanted to take a look at the most shocking and outstanding flop, and indeed flops, from every season over the last 20 years. Without further ado then, who is ironically one of football's greatest flops over that period as a whole, here is just that. 2002-03, El Hadji Juf, a man who is as widely disliked on Merseyside as Manchester United and Margaret Thatcher, El Hadji Juf, was an absolute disaster at Liverpool. The excitement around Juve's arrival at Anfield was palpable, fresh off the back of the 2002 World Cup. Juve was the star man in a Senegal team that had humbled the reigning world champions France in the opening game of the tournament, before going on to become only the second African national team to reach the World Cup quarterfinals. Liverpool paid 15 million euros for Juve, which made him the 10th most expensive signing in all of world football that season. Look, it was a different time, all right? Younger viewers will just have to trust me that it was a lot of money back then. Juve actually made a half-decent start to life in the Premier League, where manager Gerard Houllier hoped that he could be the catalyst in order for Liverpool to leapfrog Arsenal to the Premier League title, scoring a brace in only his second game for the club against Southampton, but it was all downhill from there. Juve scored just one more league goal all season, ending the campaign with three goals in 29 games, and rather than leapfrog Arsenal to the Premier League title, Liverpool dropped out of the entire top four. Juve was even worse the following season, failing to score a single goal, though by that stage expectations had been significantly tempered, and it didn't exactly help that he kept spitting at people. Dishonourable mentions for our first campaign go to Inter Milan flop, Francesco Cocco, and Sunderland failure Torre Andre Flo. 2003-04, Juan Sebastian Verón. Juan Sebastian Verón is always talked about as being a Manchester United flop, and in some ways he was, but he was actually a much worse signing for Chelsea. Manchester United paid a British record-breaking transfer fee of more than £28 million for Verón in the summer of 2001, and though he starred in Europe, he struggled to find his place within the outstanding midfield quartet of Beckham, Giggs, Scholes and Keane in the Premier League. Undeterred, Chelsea paid £15 million to sign Veron, who still had a sky-high reputation owing to his immense talent in the summer of 2003, hoping that he would come good in England as their main man. He didn't. The fact that Veron had made it clear beforehand that he didn't want to join Chelsea and saw it as a backward step perhaps ought to have been a warning sign for the Blues. But following Roman Abramovich's takeover, Chelsea wanted to make a statement. Claudio Ranieri called Veron the best midfielder in the world, but he went on to make just seven Premier League appearances at Stamford Bridge and is not fondly remembered by Chelsea fans. To rub salt even deeper into the wounds, Veron subsequently joined Inter Milan on a two-year loan deal, where he made 74 appearances, won four trophies, and was genuinely one of the best midfielders in the world once again. Dishonourable mentions go to fellow Chelsea summer signing Adrian Mutu, Ricardo Caresma at Barcelona, and midfield duo Cleberson and Eric Jemba Jemba at Manchester United. 2004-05 Matea Cashman. 
I promise you that I'm not picking on Chelsea, though you could be forgiven for thinking otherwise based upon the introduction, but it is hardly that surprising that, flush with cash during the early to mid-2000s, they spent some of it on some absolute duds. In fairness, no one was calling Matea Cashman a dud when he arrived at Stamford Bridge, obviously, otherwise he wouldn't have made this list. Following 78 goals in just 86 games over the past two seasons for PSV, still aged only 24 at the time, Cashman was among the most in-demand forwards in Europe. Lethal and instinctive in the Netherlands, Cashman looked to have had those instincts blunted in West London, and it didn't help that fellow summer rival Didier Drogba hit the ground running as soon as he arrived. A return of just four Premier League goals for someone who had previously been so prolific was miserable though, and Cashman never really recovered, barring a couple of half-decent seasons at Fenerbahce. I must also give mention to Walter Samuel, who had a horrible season at Real Madrid, following a massive 25 million euro move from Roma, Gibral Cisse, who was actually much more expensive than Cashman, and also only scored four Premier League goals that season, and Jean Alan Boomsong, a man who was so bad for Newcastle United that it actually prompted an investigation into potential corruption, since no one could quite believe that the Magpies would legitimately have paid £8 million for such a useless donkey. 2005-06, Antonio Cassano. The toughest season so far to pick a single selection from, the 2005-06 campaign saw a number of truly catastrophic flops, including Albert Luke at Newcastle, Sean Wright Phillips at Chelsea, and, perhaps most notably of all, Julio Baptista at Real Madrid, who joined Los Blancos for a mega fee following two sensational seasons with Sevilla, but was played out of position and proved to be totally ineffective at the Bernabeu. It is a fellow 2005-06 Real Madrid signing who just pips Baptista to an inclusion though. Antonio Cassano is one of the most gifted footballers that I've ever seen, and playing alongside Francesco Totti at Roma, he was virtually unstoppable. Named as Serie A Young Footballer of the Year in 2001 and 2003, Cassano was a live wire both on and off the pitch, renowned for his inspired improvisation, but also his fiery temper. At the start of the 2005-06 season, Cassano's relationship with Roma soured over constant conflicts regarding his contract situation, and in the January transfer window, he was sold to Real Madrid. Reunited with his old boss and strict disciplinarian Fabio Capello, at arguably the biggest football club in the world, it proved to be a match made in hell. Cassano was accused of drinking heavily, gaining weight, and disrespecting the club. He only managed one goal and one assist in his first half season in Madrid, before telling a radio station that he would, quote, willingly walk all the way back to Rome. You can see why the 2005-06 season was a tough one. 2006-07, Andrei Shevchenko. From an incredibly difficult decision to one of the easiest in this entire video, it's hard to put the extent of Andrei Shevchenko's 2006-07 floppiness into a 2023 context. Floppiness has connotations that I really wasn't aiming for there, but you get the idea. The closest comparison that I could come up with would probably be something like if Robert Lewandowski had scored four La Liga goals for Barcelona this season instead of 23, but even that doesn't quite do it justice. Shevchenko was just 29 when he joined Chelsea, whereas Lewandowski is already 34, and whilst the poll set Barcelona back about £40 million, Shevchenko's British record fee of £30.8 million would be akin to a fee of £113.3 million in 2022 when subject to football transfer inflation during that time. Shevchenko may always have been doomed at Chelsea. Jose Mourinho never wanted to sign him for a start, only played with one central striker, and Drogba was still very much his man. But for a Ballon d'Or winner two years earlier, who had scored 28 goals the previous season for AC Milan, to only score four Premier League goals in 30 games, there is just no way that he couldn't feature. His closest competitor was probably Gianluca Zambrotta, a magnificent fullback who was distinctly mediocre, if not worse, at Barcelona that season. 
but it had to be Shevchenko. 2708, Breno Borges. There are loads of brilliant candidates, or terrible candidates, I suppose, for the 2708 season, from Darren Bent and Royston Drenter to Orlando Bianchi and Kieran Dyer. All would be legitimate inclusions and may well have featured in other seasons, but when it came to flopping, the 2708 season was all about Breno Borges. Touted as a future star of the Brazilian national team, Breno had just been named Discovery of the Year by Brazilian journalists after helping Sao Paulo lift the Serie A title as an 18-year-old when Bayern Munich saw off competition from Real Madrid, AC Milan, Juventus and Fiorentina to sign him for his 12 million euro release clause. It was seen as a major coup, but after Breno's parents were denied German visas, he struggled bitterly to adapt to his new surroundings. In his debut campaign, Breno registered just two appearances, and he only ever went on to play 33 games for Bayern Munich, over four seasons in total. In September 2011, while suffering from serious mental health problems, Breno was arrested for setting fire to his villa in Bavaria, and causing 1.5 million euros of damage. Following 13 months behind bars for arson, Breno was released and deported to Brazil, where he tried and failed to resurrect his career at both Sao Paulo and Vasco da Gama. Still aged only 33, Breno has been without a club for the last four years, and I assume has retired, but one hopes that he is at least psychologically in a much better place now. 2008 09. Afonso Alves. The 2008-09 season, best remembered worldwide for being Hull City's first in the top flight of English football, wasn't short of a flop or two either. Peter Halmozy turned out to be a total dud, and the less said about Stelios Janakopoulos the better, but away from the KC Stadium, Robbie Keane underwhelmed at Liverpool off the back of his best ever season at Tottenham, Joe could barely get a look in at Manchester City, following his big money move, Brazilian wide man Mancini went from Serie A superstar to Super League substandard at Inter Milan, and Danny Guizza followed up a season in which he won the La Liga Golden Boot by looking fairly mediocre at Fenerbahce. All are overlooked in favour of the king of the flop though, which is a nickname that no man wants, better known as Afonso Alves. Signed by Here and Vain for 4.5 million euros in 2006, which was and still remains a club record fee, Alves scored 45 goals in 39 league games for the Dutch side, earning comparisons with fellow Brazilian scoring sensations in the Eredivisie, such as Romário and Ronaldo. That heralded a massive 12 million euro January move to Middlesbrough, where Alves struck six times in 11 Premier League matches during his first half season. Expectations that he would build upon that the following season weren't to be fulfilled though. In the 2008-09 campaign, Alves was, I believe the technical word, is cack. He only scored four goals in 31 Premier League matches, which was enough to guarantee Borough's relegation. 2009-10, Keirasson. There are more obvious candidates for the 2009-10 season, such as Alberto Aquilani at Liverpool and Roque Santa Cruz at Manchester City, but the biggest flop of all was undoubtedly Keirasson. An absolute sensation in Brazil, though Keirasson was just 21 years old at the time of the move, he had already scored 89 goals in 158 games for Cortiba and Palmeiras, including 24 goals in 36 games in his single season with Palmeiras the previous term. He set Barcelona back a potential 16 million euros amidst strong competition and immediately outlined his ambitions to break into Pep Guardiola's first team. However, just five days later, Keirasson was sent on loan to Benfica. There, he found himself as a fourth choice striker behind Oscar Cardozo, Nuno Gomez and Javier Saviola, and he played just seven games all season and failed to score a single goal. Keirasson never really recovered from his disastrous move to Barcelona and season on loan at Benfica, and he played his last game of professional football at the age of 27. Fellow 2009 Barcelona summer rival, Dimitro Chijetsky is fortunate to miss out, as is Diego, who was a fantastic footballer, 
but bitterly disappointing in his single season at Juventus. 2010-11, Fernando Torres. The 2010-11 season was actually not too bad on the flop front, Joe Cole and Bebe notwithstanding, but there is one obvious candidate. Having been terrifying to play against for the last three years at Liverpool, and without doubt one of the most devastating forwards on the planet, Fernando Torres looked uncharacteristically sluggish at the beginning of the campaign. He still managed to bag a brace against Chelsea, but outside of that, he only scored seven goals in 25 games before January. Perhaps it was crucial that his single outstanding performance came against Chelsea, who proceeded to break the British record transfer fee once again in January 2011, forking out a whopping £50 million on the faltering Spanish superstar. Chelsea clearly banked on Torres still being one of the best strikers on the planet, but he looked anything but at Stamford Bridge. In 18 games that season for the Blues, Torres only managed to score a single goal against West Ham, whilst making one of the worst misses of the Premier League era. From a season of few flops then, Torres's 2010-11 campaign stands out as one of the greatest flops since Fosbury. 2011-12, Andy Carroll. Fernando Torres and Andy Carroll were of course signed in the same January 2011 transfer window, but whilst Torres' second season at Chelsea, whilst, let's be honest, he still wasn't very good, was at least salvaged by European success, Carroll's Liverpool career suffered the exact opposite fate. Having been signed for what always seemed like a ludicrous fee of £35 million, off the back of a fantastic half-season at Newcastle, Carroll wasn't that bad in his first half-season at Liverpool, suffering a couple of injury setbacks, but still managing to bag a brace against Manchester City. It was in the 2011-12 season, fully fit, with six months getting used to his new surroundings, and expectations significantly raised that the Geordie flopped and flopped hard. Whilst fellow January 2011 arrival Luis Suarez flourished, Carroll floundered, only managing to find the back of the net four times in 34 Premier League outings. That's enough to earn him a giant wooden spoon, which he would probably drop on his foot ruling him out for six weeks, ahead of Charles and Zogbia, who was monumentally disappointing at Aston Villa that season, and Milos Krasic, who went from hero to zero almost overnight at Juventus. 2012-13, Alex Son. A perhaps surprise honourable mention for the 2012-13 season goes to Luka Modric, who was named as La Liga's worst signing of the season in 2013 by Marca, before going on to actually have a semi-decent career at Real Madrid. Gaston Ramirez at Southampton and Jack Rodwell at Manchester City were also rubbish, but not as rubbish as Alex Song who went from being a star man at Arsenal the previous season to a global laughingstock for thinking that Carlos Puyol wanted him to lift the La Liga title for Barcelona when he was actually searching out Eric Abidal, who had just recovered from a liver transplant. You shouldn't laugh, except, of course, you should if you've seen the video, because it is very funny. 2013-14, Roberto Soldado. If you look up the word flop in the Oxford English Dictionary, you will find a picture of Roberto Soldado in a Spurs shirt. Not really, there aren't any pictures in the OED, or at least not in my edition, but Soldado really was a Ballon d'Or tier flop at White Hart Lane. One of many terrible signings by Spurs in the summer of 2013, as they put their Gareth Bale money to truly terrible use, Paulinho was actually the one that I was most disappointed with in the Premier League, but this isn't about me. Soldado was signed for a club record £26 million, having bagged 25-plus goals in each of the last three seasons for Valencia, and 30 in the season before he arrived. Soldado was also Spain's first-choice number 9 at the time, having scored 7 goals from his last 10 caps. That wouldn't last long after he joined Spurs, though, where Soldado looked like a shadow of the goal machine that he had been at Valencia, and contributed virtually nothing. He scored six goals in 28 Premier League games, and four of those were penalties. Two non-penalty goals all season, off the back of a 30-goal campaign and a club record-breaking move, earns him an inclusion ahead of Paulinho, Maruan Fellaini, and Dani Osvaldo. 
2014-15, Radamel Falcao. Competition is brutal for the 2014-15 season, which was Mario Balotelli and Lazar Markovic's first at Liverpool, Eloquim Mangala and Wilfred Bonny's first at Manchester City, Jack Rodwell's first at Sunderland, and Shira Mobile's first at Borussia Dortmund. All were total car crashes, but none more so, in my view at least, than Radamel Falcao's miserable season on loan at Manchester United. Arguably the best centre forward in Europe just two years earlier, Falcao had ruptured his ACL at Monaco, but Manchester United were still pinning their hopes, and around £20 million, on him resurrecting them under Louis van Gaal, following a disastrous debut post-Fergie campaign. Falcao would do no such thing, struggling to recover from his ACL injury and adapt to the physical rigours of the Premier League at the same time, Falcao never got to grips with life at Old Trafford, and he scored an atrocious four goals in 29 games in all competitions. When one compares the hype to what was actually delivered, he is among the biggest flops in this entire video. 2015-16, Arda Toran. I was tempted to go with Memphis Depay for the 2015-16 season because the hype surrounding his move to Manchester United and comparisons with Cristiano Ronaldo and the like were so overwhelming. Meanwhile, Christian Benteke at Liverpool and Jackson Martinez, who flopped at Atletico Madrid and then effectively had his career ended in China all in the space of a single season, had a campaign to forget. But ultimately, I can't look beyond Arda Toran. Signed by Barcelona off the back of an extraordinary treble winning campaign for the club, in which he had been the star man for Atletico Madrid, Toran was one of the most highly rated midfielders in the world, and his potential €41 million Euro fee reflected that fact. Unfortunately, however, Barcelona's transfer ban at the time meant that Toran couldn't be registered, and therefore couldn't play for them, until January. When he was finally able to be registered, Toran struggled to disrupt a star-studded Barca midfield and lacked the tenacity and invention that had made him so effective for Atletico. Unlike Depay, Toran had already proved himself at the highest level and was even worse than Depay was at Old Trafford, and for that reason he features. 2016-17, Renato Sanchez. It was flop central in 2016-17, and any one of Shakodran Mustafi, Jordan Ibe, Paul Pogba, John Stones, Henrik Mkhitaryan, and Michi Batshuayi could quite legitimately have featured. I have tended to extend leniency towards young players in this video, but that charity has to end with Renato Sanchez. Such was the hype surrounding him in the summer of 2016. I should say, that hype was not without justification. He made a whopping 35 appearances in his debut campaign at Benfica, prompting a potential €18 million Euro move to Bayern Munich at the age of only 18, and he followed that up by playing a starring role as Portugal won Euro 2016. Sanchez's debut campaign was incredibly underwhelming though, as he was limited to just 25 appearances in all competitions and failed to record a single goal or assist. Oddly, Sanchez could actually feature twice in this video, successively, as despite his slow 2016-17 campaign, there were still very high hopes for him on loan at Swansea City the following season, where he experienced even greater difficulties and poorer performance levels. Still, at least he's doing alright now, and he's still only 25. 2017-18, Diego Costa. No single season had as many shortlisted candidates in my list as 2017-18, a season in which Chelsea paid £35 million for Danny Drinkwater, Barcelona forked out over €100 million Euros on Ousmane Dembele, Everton spent up to £45 million on Gylfi Sigurdsson, Alvaro Morata and Timwi Bakayoko both had, let's just say, challenging debut campaigns following big money moves to Chelsea, and Patrick Schick stunk the place out at Roma after he was signed for a club record €45 million Euro fee. Competition was stiff then, but in part because it is such a routinely downplayed or overlooked flopping, I felt compelled to pick Diego Costa. 
Outstanding for three seasons at Chelsea, during which time there wasn't a Premier League centre-back that he didn't try to kill, Costa kicked up a massive fuss in demand of a return to Atletico Madrid. It meant that he played absolutely no football for six months, and when he rejoined Atletico, it was for a mammoth £50 million fee, £18 million more than Chelsea paid for him, despite the fact that Costa was already 29 years old. In exchange for that fee, Atletico, and most onlookers in fairness, felt that they had signed a box-ready world-class centre forward who knew the club and could make an instant impact. Costa scored seven goals and made six assists, and got worse and worse with every one of his passing four seasons back in Madrid. A fantastic centre forward, but one with massively underrated flop credentials, which I'm trying to put right here and now. 2018-19. Philippe Coutinho. This video is about the biggest flops each season, not the worst signings, and yes, they are different, but Philippe Coutinho is arguably the worst signing of all time. He cost Barcelona between 105 to 142 million pounds, signing a contract worth almost half a million pounds a week. He only ever made 106 appearances at the Camp Nou, scoring 25 goals and making 14 assists, and his best performance during that time arguably came off the bench against them when he bagged a brace as Bayern Munich thrashed them 8-2 in the Champions League. We are only concerned with the 2018-19 season, which was Coutinho's first full season in Catalonia, after he crucially had what was actually a very good first half season. Expectations were sky high heading into 2018-19 then, but the Brazilian fell miles short of them, only managing to score five goals and make two assists in 34 La Liga appearances. Alexis Sanchez, Kepa Ariza Balaga, Malcolm and Lucas Torreira can consider themselves fortunate that Coutinho had higher expectations than all of them, albeit only marginally higher in the case of Sanchez. 2019-20, Eden Hazard. There is immense competition from some incredible flops in the 2019-20 season, but still my decision is a very easy one. Sebastian Aller, Luka Jovic, Nikola Pepe, Antoine Griezmann, and Joe Linton could all have featured in a handful of other seasons. Meanwhile, Tangi Ndombele went from Ndombele when he arrived at Tottenham for between 54 to 63 million pounds from Lyon to Undom Dog Dirt in North London, but none can match Eden Hazard's fall from grace. In his last game for Chelsea, Hazard tore Arsenal to shreds in the Europa League final, one of many crowning moments during seven stellar seasons in West London. Real Madrid paid a potential 146 million euros to sign Hazard, aged 28, at a time when there was a general unanimity that he was among the best five or six players in the world. In his debut campaign at the Santiago Bernabeu, though, Hazard scored just one goal and made seven assists across 22 appearances, with his solitary goal in only his fourth game for the club coming at home to Granada. It was unfathomably bad, and though things haven't got any better for Hazard since then, it's only the 2019-20 campaign that is relevant in this context. 2020-21, Timo Werner. The 2020-21 season saw two incredibly expensive young forwards, Fabio Silva and Rian Brewster, endure very difficult debut campaigns at Wolves and Sheffield United respectively. Meanwhile, Arta Melo and Miralem Pjanic, who were involved in a definitely not at all dodgy set of transfers between Juventus and Barcelona, both fell well short of expectations at their new clubs. The uber-flop of the 2020-21 campaign has to be Timo Werner, though. RB Leipzig's all-time record goalscorer, Werner was in extremely high demand after scoring 34 goals for the energy drink franchise the previous season, and Chelsea saw off intense competition from Liverpool to secure his signature, triggering the Germans' £47.5 million release clause. 
That was widely lauded as being an absolute bargain at the time, and the signing of the summer, you may recall, with Werner hailed as being a surefire thing, immediately installed as the league's third favourite to win the Golden Boot, trailing only Sergio Aguero and Harry Kane. Werner didn't win the Golden Boot, nor did he make the league's top three highest scorers, nor the top 30. In fact, in 35 Premier League appearances, Werner only managed to score six goals. I like him, and I always thought that he would come good with time if Chelsea stuck with him, but he simply has to feature. 2021-22, Romelu Lukaku. I started this video in a manner that felt as though I was picking on Chelsea, and it seems as though that is also the way in which we're going to end. If Philippe Coutinho isn't the worst signing of all time, he might have Romelu Lukaku to thank for that fact. People tend to have short memories in football, but when Chelsea signed Romelu Lukaku for £97.5 million just two years ago, he was being described as the final piece in the jigsaw. I can still distinctly remember watching the post-match coverage on Sky Sports following Lukaku's second Chelsea debut against Arsenal, in which he scored, and they won, and I think every single pundit agreed that Chelsea would win the league, and Lukaku the golden boot. That was less than two years ago. Chelsea finished that season in third, almost 20 points behind Liverpool and Man City, and Lukaku scored just seven more Premier League goals, which put him 28 in the league's scoring charts by the end of the campaign, two goals behind Emmanuel Dennis, and tied with Jack Harrison. This was one of the easiest decisions that I'll ever make, and that's despite Jadon Sancho at Manchester United and Nikola Vlasic at West Ham also falling horrifically short of stratospheric expectations at the same time. 2022-23, Rich Arlison. I mentioned a handful of 2022-23 flops in the introduction, but there was only ever going to be one winner. I like Rich Arlison, and I don't actually think that he is a talentless chicken celebrating Brazilian fraud who has been stealing a living for the last seven years like some people, but he has been something a bit like that at Tottenham this season. Signed by Everton for 35 to 50 million pounds five years ago, subject to add-ons, last summer Tottenham paid 50 million pounds to sign Richarlison, plus a potential 10 million pounds in future add-ons. That made Richarlison the second most expensive Spurs signing of all time, but he was hailed as being the man who could provide much-needed competition and rotation for Tottenham's Kane, Kulosevsky, Son forward line and push Spurs beyond mere Champions League qualification under a proven winner in Antonio Conte. Richarlison scored one Premier League goal this season. That's fewer than Luke Ayling and Yerry Mina. Say what you like about Rich Arlison, but he at least hit double figures in every one of his four seasons at Everton. Spurs finished eighth last season, Conte was sacked, but not before he'd said that Rich Arlison was rubbish this season, so, all things considered, the chicken man had to feature. Along with Kukurea, Koulibaly, Ronaldo, Phillips, and Skamaka, who I mentioned in the introduction, a special shout-out goes to Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang, whose season could only have gone worse for him if he had gone on holiday to Angola and accidentally stood on a landmine. That brings us up to the present day, but the real question, one for the comments perhaps, is who will be the biggest flop of the 2023-24 season? Anyway, thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video, I hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts and the answers to that question down below in the comments, and of course make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7s and also my second channel, both of which are on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.